A gospel reading is found in the book of Mark, beginning at the first chapter, verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Those who grew up in attending Sunday school may remember the story of Noah quite fondly. Maybe we had a teacher that used flannel boards. I don't know how many of you remember that. Or hand puppets, or wooden figurines, or a colorful picture book, or played a video to tell the story of Noah, his family, and all of the animals coming off of the ark after the rain had stopped. We heard about God promising um, never to send a flood again and putting a rainbow in the sky so that whenever God saw the bow, God would remember God's promise and never do that again. Many a crayon or marker was used to depict what that scene looked like in our imaginations. It's a meaningful story for a whole host of reasons. I always say if you had 10 preachers and you gave them all that one passage, you get 10 completely different sermons. However, recently, I heard Dr. Joy J. Moore who's a professor of biblical pe preaching at Luther Seminary, say something that I thought was so profound and worth sharing. She said, the rainbow is a sign for us to know that God is great enough to destroy everything, but God is good enough not to. The rainbow is a sign for us to know that God is great enough, big enough, mighty enough, powerful enough to destroy everything. But God is good enough, kind enough, compassionate enough, merciful enough not to. Now, I think we would agree that God is capable of doing anything God wants to. No? Yes, okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Um, because God is God. God can do anything God wants to because God is God. But God chooses not to. God chooses to make a covenant, a, a promise with the earth. God chooses to be reminded of that promise. God chooses to say no, no more. God doesn't have to. It's fascinating to me about this promise that God makes here because it's not based upon anything in return. God doesn't say, if you do this, I will do that. God will say that at another point, at another time, when God is speaking to Abram. But here, God doesn't do that. Here, God seems to be moved not by what Noah or any of the members of his family has done. Instead, God seems to be moved by what God has done and says, whenever I am tempted, whenever I am tempted, I will see the rainbow and be reminded of my promise not to do that again. And I say, thank you, God, because I'm sure we have tempted God many a times. For many of us, 
For many years, I, I, I ran uh, an after-school program. And in it, I used to tell the young people all the time, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can go and collect all the toys and, and keep it so that nobody else plays with it doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can come up with words to hurt other children's feelings doesn't mean that you should use them. It's something to think about because we always have choices to make in terms of how we treat one another. What does it mean to love each other? Yes, we may have opportunities to harm or to hurt someone, to tear them down rather than to build them up, but just because we can doesn't mean that we should. And isn't that one of the great challenges in life, no matter how old or young we are? It is one of the great temptations that we face. Temptations are, are challenges for us because often we want what we want when we want it. And that's just how it is. And it is not always a bad thing but when we are driven by it, when that is the guiding force in our lives, it becomes difficult and maybe near impossible to want what Christ wants. Because living as a follower in his service to him often requires self-sacrifice. It often requires us to say no to ourselves. It often requires us to want things that we may not necessarily want. I remember a number of years ago, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was trying to convince me that selfishness is a good thing. Um, and spent a, quite a while trying to, trying to explain to me the positive dimensions of selfishness because she said it motivates people and it helps people strive for success. And I let her speak for a while because I was curious where it was all going. And finally, when I could take no more, I looked at her and I said, you do realize you're talking to a minister, right? I mean, sometimes things sound good in our heads or, or maybe in the circle of people that we're with, but when you hold up the scriptures, it's like, mm, no, no, no. The temptation to let things other than God be the guide of our lives is always before us. It is not a new temptation. In fact, it has always been there. Maybe that's why the story of Jesus being tempted is always read on the first Sunday in Lent. Because as we prepare to journey with Christ towards the cross, it makes sense for us to look at what is at the heart of being ready for the journey. And that is remembering who we are and whose we are. Remembering that we are children of God and that we belong to God, body and soul, in life and in death, to Jesus Christ, our Lord and faithful Savior. It is no accident that Jesus is driven into the wilderness after being baptized. That's not an accident. Coming out of the water, Jesus experiences a powerful moment when he sees the heavens part and the spirit descends on him like a dove. And then he hears the voice of his father, you are my son, my beloved. With you, I am very pleased. And this is the moment when he is almost ready to begin his ministry of preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. And what better time to start? A time of affirmation and celebration, it doesn't get any better than that. But we know that it's not time yet. He needs to be tested. Because when his ministry finally does get started, that is when the pedal hits the metal and it gets real pretty fast. 
years ago, some of you may remember this, there, there was this commercial, uh, uh, auto commercial, I couldn't remember what manufacturer it was, but it showed the, the, the car door being open and closed, open and closed, open and closed, oh, you know, and it showed the seatbelt being pulled and released, pulled and released, pulled and released, or the ignition being turned on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. My favorite part was when the test dummy was behind the wheel and the car was crashing into the wall and crashing into the wall and crashing into the wall. Why do they do that? Because those tests let the manufacturers know that the car was ready to go out into the world. Without the test, they put the car out into the world and the first crash, everything would fall apart. But they tested it and tested it and tested it. Jesus is baptized, but he's not ready to begin his ministry until he has been tested. The, the other gospels let, list three temptations, but in Mark's gospel, we hear that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. 40 days of being challenged to take matters into his own hands rather than be guided by the will of the Father. 40 days of being tempted to choose to do what he could do even though he shouldn't. 40 days of being tested to see whose way will he follow, the way of his father or the way of Satan. Confronting temptation is at the beginning of Lent because it is one of the great challenges in our journey with Jesus. But I want you to hear something that is often breezed by in this gospel. It is the, the last four words in verse 13. The last four words in verse 13. It says in the New Revised, in the New International Version, I don't remember what it said in the New Revised Version, but the New International Version, the last four words in verse 13 says, and angels attended him. And angels attended him. How often when we think of temptation stories, or this one with Jesus, do we picture Jesus alone and seemingly abandoned to deal with everything all by himself? And yet the text reminds us that he was not alone even in the wilderness, even during these moments of great temptation. And neither are we, neither are we alone. Because of Christ, we have been given the Holy Spirit, Spirit who leads and guides us, who teaches and corrects us, who comforts and strengthens us, who awakens and enlightens us, who enables and encourages us. We are not alone. God is with us. And as we begin this Lenten journey, turning our attention to the cross and the 40 days ahead, let us know that at the heart of being ready is trusting, trusting Jesus to be with us through it all, through it all, through every ups and downs, through every temptation and challenge, through every hurdle and struggle. For the same God who, out of goodness, set the rainbow in the sky is the same God who, out of love for the world, sent Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. In a kingdom not made of bricks or mortar, not here today and gone tomorrow, but a kingdom that is eternal, in which we are invited to call our home. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, that on this first Sunday in Lent, as we begin this journey towards the cross, 
And we are surrounded and tempted and tested at every turn. We're grateful to know that you are with us. When we ask, oh God, for your wisdom and your insight, we ask for trust and faith more and more that we might follow where you lead and do as you command. As we seek to live into what it is that Christ has called us to be and to do as the church, as the church of Jesus Christ in this world that you love. We pray all of this, O oh God, in the precious name of your Son. Amen. Amen.